Brother Mullen Paul, we thank God for your ministry. Would you welcome Brother Arlo, Dr. Arlo Mullen Paul from out in California, from all over the world, actually. He's going to talk to us. God bless you, sir. When it comes to origins, when it comes to how the world come about, how was man formed? You really only have two choices. Either God was involved or God wasn't involved. And I'm here to tell you, God was involved. Amen. I've been asked to speak on seven things that you should know about evolutionism. And uh, last year we spoke on what parents and children should know about evolution. And uh, when I got to this topic of seven things you should know about evolution, I had to think of a lot of things that I would want you to know I talked about last year. So at the first year notes, I'm just going to review just just a minute. Oh, my. Mike, there we go. Last year, I mentioned that evolution was not scientific because it was not observable, repeatable, subject to experimentation. I mentioned that evolution contradicted known scientific laws, such as the law of biogenesis, where life only comes from other life. It contradicts the law of kinds. Everything brings forth after its kind. It contradicts the second law of thermodynamics, where things go from order to disorder. I mentioned that evolution had bitter fruits, such as the fruits of abortion, uh, Nazism, slavery. Uh, evolution rests on two foundations, time and chance. And evolution, for all practical purposes, is mathematically impossible. So I think these are among seven things you should know. So we're going to talk today about seven more things that you should know. First thing I think you should know is that evolutionists have no scientific evidence for an old earth. Have you ever asked an evolutionist about the problem? Or have you ever observed evolution? And they say, no, it occurs too slowly. They need an old earth for their theory, but they have no, ev no evidence whatsoever. They try to use radiometric dating, such as the uranium lead method, but there are some assumptions in radioactive dating method. First one is that a person must know the concentration of both the radioactive isotope and the decay product. Now, that may be a little bit big there, but uh, what I'm saying is if you use uranium lead, at the start, they assumed that there was uranium and no lead. Well, I asked the question, couldn't God have created lead as well as uranium? <laughs> then the other thing that they assume in dating, using radiometric dating methods, is that the changes in concentration, say, of the uranium and lead, can only occur by radioactivity, when it is known that as much, of, much as 99% of the uranium can leach out of the soil by acids and so forth. The third thing is they assume that the rate of decay is constant. For example, I believe the half-life of uranium and lead is somewhere in the billion year range that a pound of, a of uranium decay into half a pound of uranium would take some billion years. Has anybody been observing it? No. Because of that assumptions, those assumptions, some huge errors have been made. For example, they took some rocks from a volcanic eruption that they knew occurred in 1801. History tells when that erupted. They analyzed the rocks as being between 160 and 3 billion years. That's quite an area, error from 200 years. Another method that evolutionists use to date rocks is by what's called the index fossils. They assume that certain Creatures live during certain periods. For example, the coelacanth fish. They assume that it became extinct about 70 million years ago. So therefore, if you find a rock that has a coelacanth fossil in it, then that rock must be 70 million years old. And the coelacanth was supposed to be a transitional form between a fish and an amphibian. And I mentioned it supposedly became extinct 70 million years ago. And its fossils were used as index fossils to date the rocks. 
unfortunately for evolutionists, they started catching these again in the 1930s. <laughs> well, needless to say, evolutionists don't use that as an index fossil anymore. And the truth is, they date the rocks by the fossils, and they date the fossils by the rocks. That's called circular reasoning, which isn't the highest form of logic. Okay. Mount St. Helens was a beautiful mountain. I had the privilege of living in Oregon for a couple of years. And this is what it looked like on May 17, 1980. This is like what it looked like one day later, May 18, 1980. Now, why is the Mount St. He Helens eruption so significant? Well, it showed that things like stratification and erosion could be, could be accomplished in a short time by a catastrophe. In fact, some of the changes like canyon formation, layering, so forth, that was thought to take thousands of years took place in minutes and moments. And this helps us to understand the biblical flood. I do not think that the Grand Canyon was formed by a meandering Colorado River some millions of years, but after the flood, you know, there was a release of, of energy and, and uh, water flow and so forth that caused uh, huge formations. Another thing I find very interesting, we're talking about evolutionists have no evidence for an old earth. It is interesting that no tree seems to be older than about 4,500 years ago. That's about how old. They get that from counting tree rings. Was there any event that occurred about 4,500 years ago? Noah's flood. And the flood destroyed most of the trees, and I believe that's where we get our coal from, the remains of the many, many trees that were uh, buried during the time. Second thing I want you to know about evolution is that evolution contradicts population statistics. I personally believe the Bible teaches that only eight souls were saved by water. Do you believe that? Yeah. Everybody. Adam was the first man, Eve, the mother of all living. The population grew rapidly. I don't know whether millions or billions, but there was a flood, and Peter says only eight souls were saved by water. That was Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Mrs. Shem, Japheth, Mrs. Japheth, and uh, Ham and Mrs. Ham. All right. Now, when they got off the ark, they were told to multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. I don't know, pray, probably a year if they got off the, off the ark. Uh, Japheth and Mrs. Japheth had little Japheth. And Shem and Mrs. Shem had little Shem. And Ham and Mrs. Ham had a little Ham. And probably a year or two later, I had more hams. Okay. Now, as you can see, it wouldn't have taken but two or three years, and the population would have doubled to 16. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to multiply two times eight, get 16. I don't know how many kids they had, but uh, they probably, in 20 years or so, uh, Japheth and Mrs. Japheth announced they were grandparents. And uh, there was more, and the population doubled to 32. And as you can see from this chart, it only takes 10 doublings for the population to reach 8,000 people. Another 20 doublings, and the population would reach 8 million people. Another 20 doublings, and you will have the population reach 9.6 billion people. Anybody know what the population of the world is today somewhere six, six and a half billion people. So it only took 30 doublings of population since Noah got off the ark for our present population to occur. Now to achieve the present population starting with eight people 4,500 years ago that we get from genealogies and history would require the population to double once every 130 year, 150 years or an average growth rate of one half percent per year. That's all that would be needed for eight people 4,500 years ago to reach our present population. 
Does anybody know what the population growth rate of the world is today? Well, it's about 2% a year. So it is increasing over four times that the rate that was needed to take eight people to reach our present population. Now, if man had been here another 1,500 years and it doubled 40 times, instead of having nine or six billion, we would have 9,000 billion people. If we had been here 50 doublings, that'd been another 3,000 years longer, we'd have nine million billion people. If we had been here twice as long, 9,000 years, we'd have 10 billion billion people. That's only at a growth rate of a half a percent per year, taking only 9,000 years. Evolutionists say man's been here for one to three million years ago. Now, what about 10 billion billion people? What would 10 billion billion people be like? Currently, if you calculate the surface area of the Earth, recognize only about 30% is land, we average about 100 people per square mile with our present population. But if we had 10 billion billion people, we'd have 100 billion people per square mile. <laughs> now, let's put that in a smaller thing. That would mean just 9,000 years, we'd have over 4,000 people per square foot. I thought about seeing how many young men here could stand on top of my notebook here. That's just 9,000 years, just twice as long as what the Bible says. But what if man had been here millions of years, as evolutionists propose? You would have been crushed. <laughs> okay. So much for an old earth. Population statistics confirm the biblical record. Okay, now, another thing I want you to know is that practically every evolutionary story that has been taught in high schools and colleges during the 20th century have now, has now been debunked. By the way, I do believe in one form of evolution. On the left is when we got married. This is what some of us look like now. We're still the same species, though. I happened to obtain about three years ago this tooth in rural Tennessee, and I was wondering if you could draw what creature that came from. I've given this to students before, and... I've gotten all kinds of pictures of the creature they thought that came from. Pretty hard to draw one, you know, from one tooth. Well, I have a little advantage. It's my brother's wisdom tooth. Okay. All right. Now, the reason why I did that, the reason why I did that is because Nebraska man, the one that was thought to be the oldest evidence, or the first evidence of ape-like men in the Western Hemisphere, that evidence for that was one tooth. And four and a half years later, they discovered it was the tooth of a wild pig. <laughs> From that one tooth, they drew this picture. Two people they drew from one tooth, which turned out to be a pig's tooth. Somebody said they'd have found a jaw full of teeth they could have drawn a yearbook. <laughs> now, what did the first man look like? Is that clear? It doesn't look like it's showing up very well. I don't know if you can see my... Okay. Uh, did the first man look like Ramapithecus or, or Australiapithecus or... Neanderthal man, what did the first man look like? Did Adam come out of the cave dragging Eve by the hair? Is that your conception? Well, I want to say you cannot tell from a bone or a 
tooth or a little bitty thing like that, you can't tell a lot of things. You can't tell the ear, you can't tell the mouth, you can't tell the hair, hair you can't tell the eyes, you can't tell the skin fat. So most of what you see in textbooks and in museums are just the reconstructions of an artist who's using his own imagination, often with an evolutionary bias. What did the first man look like? The Bible says Adam was made in the image of God. The Bible says that Jesus is the express image of his person. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So Adam was made in the image of God. The image of God was Jesus Christ. Christ, the image of God. When God formed man, it wasn't an afterthought that God had to create because man goofed up. No, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. In the mind of God, God knew he was going to come in the form of a body. Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. And I believe that he formed Adam to look like the body that he was going to occupy when he was born in Bethlehem. So Adam looked like Jesus Christ, not some ape man. Man is different from mammals. Man is an uh, animal uh, where an ape can walk on two feet. You scare them, they'll go on two feet. Man's the only one with, I mean, go on four feet. Man's the only creature with permanent bipedal location. Feel your nose. If you've got your pug nose, you've got a permanent a bridge on it compared to the face of a monkey with just more or less the face with some holes in it for nostrils. Uh, you have a chin. Ape does have a chin. All your toes point the same directions. Not so for an ape. You have a relatively hairless body while an ape is, is covered with hair. Most Olympics are won by people in the 20s. So man has the longest period of postnatal growth. So where Olympics are won by people in the 20s and 30s, the Kentucky Derby is won by three-year-olds. What Olympic, has ever been, Olympic event has ever been won by a three-year-old? Okay, number four. The fossil record is an embarrassment to evolutionists. If evolution was true, we should find fossils of transitional forms. Darwin thought the fossil evidence would be found. It's been 140 plus years, billions of fossils have been formed, found, and they still give no evidence of gradual change from simpler to more complex plants and animals. Instead of confirming evolution, the fossil record is a record of death and burial by the flood. The fossils say no to evolution. And then, fifth thing I want to say is that evolution just doesn't make sense. Okay. If two people were walking down a seashore and they came up and saw this sand castle, they could agree on a lot of things. They could probably agree on the color. They could probably agree on the height. They could agree on a lot of things. But they, neither one of them saw how that sand castle was formed. One of them said, I believe the wind and the waves washed up that sand castle. The other one said, I believe there was a sculptor or a team of sculptures. Which one makes more sense? Well, I hope you think it makes more sense that there was a sculptor. Let's use another example. We didn't seem to get through the last one. You go in South Dakota, go in South Dakota, and you see the Badlands. It's not hard to believe that wind and erosion and so forth over hundreds, maybe thousands of years produced this, what I call, bad land. Drive a little further in South Dakota, the Black Hills, and isn't it wonderful what the wind and the waves and the air blew up, huh? How many think that happened? If there was a sculptor who sculpted a nose and eyes and made it look like George Washington and Teddy Roosevelt and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, if a sculptor did it, how much more we and the, and the complexity that we see in the universe, it is much easier to believe there was a creator. Thank God. Hallelujah. Now, I meant to start my timing. How much time do I got, Brother Marlon? I don't want to run over. Ten minutes. Let's start ten minutes, and when ten minutes is up, 
I will quit. Oh, boy, let me get that over again. I pressed the wrong button. These are complicated gadgets. These times. Okay, the rotation of the earth, once every 24 hours. The tilt of the earth, 23 degrees at, at a quarter degrees, which gives us our seasons. The revolution around the sun, which gives us our years. The air and the water and the vegetation. Ours is the only place in the universe that has all these things. Was it by accident? No. The Bible says God formed the earth to be inhabited. Praise God. And if you think of it, when he did that in six days, think about what Jesus is doing when he went away and said, I go to prepare a place for you. Whoo! What a place that's going to be. Thank God. The sun shows purpose and design for light by day, energy and earth. The right amount of energy. If we had 1% more energy, we'd burn up. If we'd have 1% less energy, we would freeze to death. It's the right kind of energy. Most stars, the radiation is lethal, deadly. Our sun produces most of its energy in the, the visible or near visible spectrum. The moon shows purpose and design. Adequate night illumination. Every month we get from the word moon regular tides which cleanse our shorelines. The stars give evidence of design and planning. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I personally believe that the witness of God the Creator is throughout the whole earth. Any person with just any kind of reasonable honesty could look at the stars and the heavens and realize there must have been a Creator. But it's up to us to tell them that the great Creator became our Savior. Praise God. Hallelujah. The human body shows purpose and design. The Bible says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah. By the way, my wife put this in. This is our granddaughter. She had a... <laughs> Ask her to show the picture. She's got... They're really good. Okay. Oh, thank God. If you ever get in the blues, sometimes it discouraged. Just thank God for two eyes, two ears, 32 teeth, a lung, kidneys, a heart. Amen. And a whole lot of things that I may not know the function of. But thank God we're wonderfully and fearfully made. Hallelujah. And any piece of equipment that you buy has... I like an automobile that has a, a maintenance manual or it has an instruction manual. It's the owner's manual. It's the, the produced by the person who made the automobile. Thank God we are wonderfully made and we have an instruction manual. It's the Word of God. Hallelujah. Thank God for His Word. Amen. Amen. The other thing I want to mention is both creation and evolution are religious views. In our country, we are being brainwashed to say that you can teach evolution in the schools because it's scientific, but you cannot teach creation because it's religion. Isn't that right? But I tried to show you at the first of the slide of last year, evolution is not scientific. It's not observable, repeatable, verifiable. Subject experimentation, it contradicts known laws of science. It is not science. It is science falsely so called. So religion is a belief system. You have to believe. The issue is not science versus religion, but religion versus religion, and the choice becomes a matter of faith. Dwayne Gish uh, no, one person said, uh, was asked, why don't you believe in evolution? He said, I don't have enough faith to believe in it. I mean, it takes an order, of, it takes a great order of faith to believe that a kernel of energy exploded 13.5 billion years ago and formed an orderly universe, which formed an orderly solar system, which formed orderly life. That takes a faith of measure higher than I've got. <laughs> Dwayne Gish says this, it's unbelievable what an unbeliever must believe in to believe in evolution. <laughs> Lastly, 
There is no credible mechanism. Evolution has no credible mechanism. You'll hear about mutations. They have probably done more studies on mutations on fruit flies than anything else. They've created, uh, radiated these fruit flies. They've come up with fruit flies that had curly wings, short wings, no wings, and uh, they died a lot faster than the other ones. Most mutations are harmful. It's like trying to climb a ladder. If you go up one step and fall down 999, you're not going to make much progress. None of the mutations ever produced anything but a fruit fly. Most of them sick fruit flies. None ever produced a new species. Praise God. So seven more things you should know. They have no evidence for an old earth. Evolution contradicts population growth statistics. Most evolutionary stories have been debunked. The fossil record's an embarrassment to evolutionists. Evolution does not make sense. Evolution is a religious view. Evolution has no credible mechanism. I'm glad I believe in a creator. Praise God. Amen.